Uh, let's talk about this, Alan. Um, yeah. with, after Alan Ng's review of the film Wish, uh, current and former employees uh, have from Disney and in the world of animation reached out to Film Threat. And the letters were heartbreaking. Telling a story of a company that has been um, uh, kind of uh, the, the best word, the word that was used consistently that we kept noticing in all the correspondence was activists. Activists have kind of uh, uh, taken over and, and led to a lot of changes in the type of content that Disney produces. Uh, after weeks of, of getting these letters, um, the first in a series of stories have now appeared at filmthreat.com. I'm going to share screen and um, then I'm going to hand it over to you, Alan. Um, oh, sorry. This is, this is the front page of Film Threat. We post new film reviews every day. Go on our front page. A lot of indie film reviews, a lot of movies you may not have heard of. Um, anything from indie short films to features, whatnot, uh, horror, sci-fi, name the genre, we cover it, along with a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, all the mainstream movies do appear. I know there'll be a review of Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, but on the front page of Film Threat right now, the first story, The Defiles, Part One, Disney and the Downfall of John Lasseter, Alan. Tell us about this story. Yeah, so uh, to this is the first of the of the series, and and I felt like this was the most important story to tell right off the bat because I think it it was uh, John Lasseter's firing, oh, I'm sorry, resignation that um, that kind of started the downfall of Disney, both creatively and financially, and so we kind of go into the uh, the specifics here of. Uh, of what happened, you know, and so uh, it just starts off and I set the stage, the fact that, you know, Pixar was, uh, you know, Pixar is basically the gold standard when it comes to CG animation, feature animation, starting with Toy Story and, uh, and to today. And, uh, and it was clear that uh, the, the figurehead, the, the, the person you saw all the time when we ever talked about Pixar was John Lasseter. Uh, and then, you know, because of uh, Michael Eisner's follies, uh, the, there was a announcement of a divorce between Pixar and Disney. Disney would no longer be the uh, the distributor of Pixar films and that they were going to go and take take, uh, you know, do films for another studio. And at which point uh, the, a coup took place, uh, taking down Michael Eisner. Uh, Roy Disney was kind of responsible for that. Roy Disney Jr. And uh, installed Bob Iger. And the and one of the early things Bob Iger did was buy Pixar, and not only buy Pixar, but now put John Lasseter in a position of prominence. At which point, uh, at, at this point, was the creative chief creative creative officer of both Disney and Pixar, and uh, and that role uh, spanned not just the animation department but everything, uh, theme parks, um, you know. And so you saw this kind of renaissance occurring with Disney. Uh, there's a lot of excitement behind it. You know, everyone was saying Bob Iger is is an amazing guy because he he bought Pixar, he bought Marvel, he bought all these things. Um, and uh, and what we what we soon see is that uh, that there's a lot of attention being given to John Lasseter. In fact, uh, you know, I, I think you could say that John Lasseter could have been the 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 Walt Disney of the Walt Disney Company. In terms of being the for the figure at the forefront, um, being the lovable guy, you know everything you felt about Walt, the congeniality of that you felt with John Lasseter, and um, and so the question was was that uh, you know were they going to allow this to continue? You know where was was were there were there uh, things going on in the background? People concerned about John Lasseter. Uh, taking on the mantle and being the figurehead and, and one day taking over the entire Disney uh, operation. Well, we don't know, but we do know what happened to him. Um, two things happen. One is uh, one thing you don't know about John Lasseter is a, he's a really lovable guy. You know, this part uh, he's, he's a, 
incessant hugger. He loves to hug. He has a penchant for hugging and showing affection. But when it, but the other side of John Lasseter you don't know is the fact that he is a uh, he is a perfectionist. In fact, uh, he demands the best out of everyone who works for him. And uh, if if you were to present an idea or a project or some scene that you were working on to John, uh, it was it was almost as if uh, all emotion left him and he would critique your your work and uh, he would tear it to shreds you know he, and not only that uh, he, not only would he tear it to shreds but then he would tell you uh, why your why your idea sucked but then he'd tell you how you make it better and um, some people would consider that to be you know a good thing you know a, a learning opportunity um, but but what seems to have happened is uh, some people didn't take it that way and um and so maybe some resentment was uh, was being built up uh, people were observing this and uh, and then on the other hand uh because john lasseter was the chief creative officer at disney uh he more or less became the bottleneck of ideas meaning you bring an idea to john uh you were you were waiting for john to give you feedback and waiting is what you did you waited and you waited and it, and projects started to slow down started to come in late. And, uh, you know, the, the combination of those two of those seem to have been the start of his downfall. And now we cut to uh, Harvey Weinstein, uh, who, uh, you know, basically the, the reason the Me Too movement started. And, uh, and there's a little phenomenon uh, known as the Weinstein effect, where the momentum of taking down Weinstein was so great that that the that other people were being targeted, and uh, John Lasseter was one of those targets. In fact, uh, from the people we talked to, uh, almost all of them told us that uh, it was just a matter of time. You know, they 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 knew that uh, once Weinstein went down, uh, Lasseter was going to be next, and and not that necessarily he did something wrong, but uh, his his affectionate uh, gestures, his penchant for hugging and touching. Um, people knew that there was, there was going to be trouble brewing. Um, you know, you've talked about spending time with John Lasseter yourself, Chris, uh, you know, that he liked to drink. Uh, he was a wine connoisseur and, uh, and it was, uh, confirmed to us that at public events, office parties, office celebrations, that, uh, Disney corporate had to have handlers, uh, with John to make sure that he didn't get into any trouble. And so when Me Too came around, uh, it felt what people observe, what people in the company felt like was that uh, that there was a there was an activist element within the company that was gunning for for John Lasseter, and uh, and so the stories came out about uh, inappropriate touching, about uh, you know inappropriate behavior at an Oscar party, um, and then soon accusation and accusation came out, and. Uh, and uh, this, you know, ultimately John would uh, do a leave of absence. This is what you do in corporate world when when you get when there are accusations against you, you you take a leave of absence and you, you know, you reflect. And um, and uh, I think you know, and, and so this leave of absence went on for a few months, and then it was announced that John would be uh, let go and that he would finish out the year and be gone, and. Uh, so, so what this article goes through is, you know, some of the details of that in terms of uh, I, what what seemed to happen was that there was uh, people were just not not a hundred percent confident that the stories and allegations laid against John were uh, were accurate and that they seemed political in nature. And it's not that they weren't accurate, but maybe that they were a little bit overblown. Um, you know, people people. You know, there are people who liked being hugged by John, people who look forward to one day getting a Lasseter hug. But certainly there are people who are not, you know, who who are not, you know, they they don't want to be hugged. They they want their personal space. And that's perfectly fine. Um, and I think from those people, some felt that uh, that maybe their career was going to stall if they didn't submit to the hug. And and I, I'm not saying that in a mean way. I, I think if you if you don't want to be hugged, you don't want to be hugged, and you shouldn't be penalized for that. But 
again, it just seemed like there was an activist element that was gunning for for John Lasseter and to to basically make him ex an example. And and it was ultimately his firing that kind of set the stage for kind of an internal civil war at Disney. And uh, and we're going to basically go through that uh, in the in the coming weeks. But uh, it, it just felt like that, you know, that a lot of people were were heartbroken, confused um, uh, about John's John's leaving. And uh, and because of the Me Too movement, you know, no one could say anything. Uh, no one could defend him without being uh, accused of being a misogynist or or a traitor to women. And so people were forced to keep their mouths shut. People were forced to people couldn't even ask a question about what really happened. And then I think you told the story of, uh, you know, when at an all hands meeting, when uh, when it was announced that John was no longer going to be with the company, uh, a woman raised her hand and said, can we let a woman run this place now? And that took a lot of people off guard uh, when when they heard that, and so uh, yeah, so you know, well, it's not only not only that people who were in favor of John uh, were uh, they weren't allowed to have that opinion. Mm -hmm. There were, I mean, and you're going to see. So this is the first article. Obviously, the holidays are kicking yeah. off. In January, the next one will come out. Yeah, yeah, but what I'm saying is, most people are actually already on holiday are already off work for the next couple of weeks, but this is part one before the holiday starting next year. This will be a almost, I, I don't want to commit you to it like every week, yeah. but this will be a series of stories that will probably run over the next couple of months, taking an aspect and it'll be in chronological order. So this is really yeah. the beginning of this story. I, 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 I read the letters that we received. Mm -hmm. Obviously I read the story and worked with you on it. I had very, Few, yeah. uh, few fixes. Yeah. Here, I mean, but, but like, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll say the the next article. I believe if uh, you know, assuming everything goes to plan, um, we'll we'll show that a lot of the the DEI stuff that we complain about uh, over the last few years uh, began long before Bob Iger came on board. And not just that, we're going to reveal the D the companies that actually provide the DEI service and what the reaction to that is. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and a quick, quick thing, I got to do a, a, a shout out to yellow flash who helped us with the AI art and we appreciate it. He basically helped create that image and then Alan kind of expanded on it. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Shout out to yellow flash. Yeah. Oh, it's always, a great... always a big thanks to him. <laughs> it's like, no, yeah. it's great. I, I, love I might, I might hit you up again, yellow flash. Um, but in any case, um, it's, it's, it's an amazing read. And uh, just thank you for, I mean, I will say this, the one criticism this article is going to get is unnamed sources. Mm -hmm. But here's what I'll say about that. There are a lot of other unnamed sources on the opposite side of the equation. Yeah. Meaning people who, um, how many times did a Me Too allegation happen and there was an unnamed source? Yeah. Apparently well, those I, I, okay. quote, I, I quote the Hollywood Reporter, the New Yorker, the New York Times, and all of them are uh, are reporting from unnamed sources. So anyone that would critique this story as to as having unnamed sources, these are the unnamed sources that that were in fear that they could not express themselves. Yeah. Either at Disney or to the trades. And I do feel that the trades are compromised. They're compromised in the sense that they want to put out a certain story, and once it was decided that this that this was the story that they were going to put out, no other voices were heard. Yeah. Okay, in this and, thing, and, it was a, it was a, okay. Sorry. Yeah, and and the thing here is, if if John Lasseter had done what he was accused of doing, then he should have been fired. He should have been out of there. But the thing was, is we don't know. You know, if, even people within Disney, they they've heard these, they heard the allegations, and they couldn't say a thing, and they couldn't ask questions, and so, you know, so we don't know. He may have been guilty. He may not have been. But but you can see that. You know, when John left, he the, there was a big defection from Disney Animation, uh, from Disney Animation to Skydance Animation, and, and that should say something about how people about people and their belief as to whether John was guilty or not. And let's just say this too: this is about men in power. And mm -hmm. let me just say that and white men um, in power. Let's put it that way. What's that? White men in power for right, right, right. And so let's just say this. 
when Harvey Weinstein went down, Harvey Weinstein, what Harvey Weinstein did, Harvey Mo Weinstein was a monster who did things that mm -hmm. were illegal, which is why he is currently in prison. Yes. He was convicted of the crimes he was charged with. And uh, John Lasseter is currently working, and a lot of people jump ship to work with John Lasseter. That alone should tell you something about him, that if John Lasseter was the monster that, that he was portrayed to be in these stories that came out, do you think people would still be working with him? No. Uh, the one thing that's interesting in your story, um, which, because you I interviewed a lot of people, uh, about he was kind of, when it came to... And I, I, I've heard this before, like in just dealing with creative people, sometimes you want to be cold with your criticism. Mm -hmm. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. This is bad. This is why it's bad. Boom. Like he was just, when it came to the work, he was very, very direct. Some people don't take that well. When you do a, they do this thing and they do it at San Diego Comic-Con and other places. They do a portfolio review. You don't do, if, if you're doing a portfolio review with someone you don't do them any favors by saying, looks great. Keep doing what you're doing. That's just give you enough rope and you can, and, and you'll ruin your career. You won't even have one. You need specific critique to get better. Mm -hmm. And when you know anything, and I think everybody knows this story, the first toy story, they stopped working on it and said, we got it. They almost made the whole movie. They said, we got to like, stop. We got to start from scratch. This isn't working. Yeah. This is cool. And that's happened many times at Pixar. I mean, the Good Dinosaur yes. is another example of a of a of a story that stopped and had to be re readjusted or re or done over again. So it's it's not uncommon. And in the end, they still had to make a deadline and ended up with a movie that was less than what you would think the quality um, that Pixar should be putting out. Uh, but your 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 story, I think, is very measured, very balanced, and provides a side that um, hasn't been heard. And is yeah. worth hearing. So I hope that you'll yeah. check in. We'll we'll let you know when um, upcoming installments and and it's going to take it's going to bring us up to the present, climaxing with Wish and what went wrong. So mm -hmm. I mean, I was Alan and I've had many offline conversations. This could evolve into a book. You never know. Could evolve into a book. Who knows? But uh, yeah. the series of articles. And, yeah, sorry? and I, we should make it clear. We don't know what happened. Uh, Chris and I don't know what happened at, at Disney during that time. Uh, we're only, you know, again, people have reached out to us and wanted to get their story out. And that's what we're doing here. And I will say this, the, the stories that people have been telling us, it's a long time coming. It's like, it's like everything sort of erupted after wish. It's like, that's the last straw. Yeah. The wish was sort of like the disappointment, not just creatively, financially, everything about wish. And this year, the only movie that made money for Disney as a company was Guardians 3. And it barely, barely made money. And barely made money. And everything else has been um, a disaster. Has yeah. been a disaster. Yeah. One, one thing to point out is what, what was the last project that uh, that John Lasseter worked on with Disney? Uh, and it was Coco, and Coco is considered oh. to be to be the shining star, the 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 gold standard of of Pixar. Uh, did, and I, uh, and and if you see the work since Coco, you know what kind of vacuum that's been left. Uh, and I think this is the point of of the series and the article was not only was was John's removal uh, created a a creative vacuum within Disney. Um, John's removal also created fundamentally changed the corporate culture of Disney uh, mm. to to a place where you wanted to work, you know, decades ago to a place now that you avoid like the plague. And we've heard that from a lot of freelancers who uh, have done work for Disney. They they have a reputation amongst creatives as a workplace that is toxic and um, bullying. There is a, a habit of bullying and almost some of the stories they tell are like the people doing the bullying enjoy doing the bullying because that's all they are is bullying. We're bullying. We're talking about HR department. We're talking about, and, and you'll see this is, <laughs> and you were telling me, excuse me, before we started, Alan, that this is the lightest of the stories. This is yeah. like, 
Yeah, because I, I mean, part of it is I think I I don't think anything that I've said surprises anybody, you know, uh, about John's right. nature and about how how he left, you know. Uh, and the other thing was, you know, when John was there, uh, it was there was a feeling of family, of camaraderie amongst the employees, right? And and that that went when he left. Right. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to the future installments, Alan. Um, it's on the front page of Film Thread at filmthread.com. Or, or if it's not on the front page, just look up the details. Yeah. Um, we should probably keep this on as the primary image for. Yeah, it'll days. be there until uh, tomorrow morning. So, what do we, we have? have other movies? <laughs> I know we do, but you should you should make sure to feature it. Isn't there yeah. a way we can pin it? Yeah, we can. Once, once, uh, once social media goes out for it then then it'll appear in the bottom bottom windows we yeah. will put a link in the description for this story and you'll be able to read the entire thing um i love this photo this uh piece <laughs> of art that you made uh which is great no, I was so, Lenucci. Lenucci. yeah no but it's um it's worth and i and i hope some other hope some other youtube channels check out the story we'll put a link in the description for this episode of the our live stream you can check out the story. You can just go to filmthreat.com right now. Let's go to your okay, chat. And, you, and I'll say it. If you work for John and want to want to talk to us a little bit more, uh, yeah, hit us up at filmthreat.com slash contact. Filmthreat.com slash contact goes directly to Alan or and I. And um, we obviously we protect our sources. Yeah. So feel free to reach out to us. Yeah.